Hello, and thank you for tuning into our program today. My name is William Stewart. I'd like to encourage you to open up your Bible and follow along as we study. We're going to be in Ruth chapter 4 this week. We began our series in the book of Ruth a few weeks back, and we followed the return of Naomi to Bethlehem, accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, after the decease of their two husbands. Ruth has lived up to her name, which means friendly. She has been a valued friend to her mother-in-law, determined to be faithful to her. Ruth has met Boaz, a relative of Naomi's dead husband, in the fields of Bethlehem, and he has shown an interest in caring for her and Naomi, and so finally, as you'll recall from last week, Naomi sent Ruth to Boaz, asking that he marry her. We saw last time his willingness to do so because of the wonderful character that we see Ruth having. She is a virtuous woman. However, you may recall that there was a closer relative than he who might perform the duty of a close relative. We had looked in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and noticed in that text the things that were written in the law with regard to the duty of a close relative. And there was one closer than he who might perform that duty. And so this is where we pick up in chapter 4 now, as Boaz is pursuing whether or not he will marry Ruth or this closer relative. Chapter 4 of the book of Ruth. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Eliamech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, You must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore the close relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Eliamex and all that was Chilion's, and Mahon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Mahon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Epatra and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. 
And when he went in to her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life, and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child, and laid him on her bosom, and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. As we begin chapter 4, it is the next morning. Boaz has assembled the close relative and some of the city elders at the gate of the city so that this issue might be addressed. At first, when Boaz mentions about the property, the close relative was interested in the land, but upon hearing about Ruth, his interest was gone. It seems that he was interested in the land for himself, but once he learned that he would have to perpetuate another man's name in Israel, he wasn't interested any longer. His concern was for his own inheritance and the effect that it may have on it. And so Boaz and this man performed a ceremony as prescribed in the Law of Moses with the removal of a sandal, and then Boaz was free to marry Ruth. Now keep in mind that the reason that Boaz needed to come before the elders and approach this man and the reason for this ceremony is that it was prescribed in the Law of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 25 and beginning at verse 5 going through to verse 10. It tells us about what should take place if a man were deceased and had no offspring and yet his wife remained. And so they're following what God had established in his law. Boaz is now free to buy back everything that belonged to Eliamek and Chilion and Mahon and to receive Ruth, the widow of Mahon, as wife. But I want you to notice that he did not do it to serve himself. Look at his reasoning in verse 10. He says, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malhan, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. His actions were not actions of selfishness, they were actions of selflessness. He received Ruth, certainly because he had grown to love her, but also because he had a sense of duty. He understood the seriousness of Malon not having any offspring, that his name would not be perpetuated in Israel, neither by his inheritance nor by his place at the city gate. And so Boaz is going to provide an heir for the one who is dead, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren. The people of the city proclaim blessings upon Boaz and Ruth. Take notice, if you will, in verse 11, all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. 
That's quite a blessing that they just pronounced upon Boaz and Ruth. They look back at their history, at how it is that they became a nation. And, of course, we understand that Rachel and Leah were the two wives of Jacob, Jacob eventually being called Israel. And so, may your house be prosperous. May your house fare as well as the very ones who began our nation. That's quite a blessing. The second part of the blessing, or the second blessing, at verse 12, is very much the same. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this woman. Again, now we're not dealing with the nation as a whole, but that particular tribe, and the segment of the tribe that lived in the region of Bethlehem, May your house prosper like our forefathers, is the idea, both in verse 11 and verse 12. And again, notice at the latter part of verse 11, it says, May you prosper in a pasra and be famous in Bethlehem. And once more, in verse 14, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. They're pronouncing wonderful things for Boaz and for Ruth. And indeed it should be. She is a wonderful person. She has served her mother-in-law, Naomi, faithfully. Boaz has been diligent in his care for them and been happy to perform the duty of a close relative, even as the scriptures would command him to do. And so here they are being compared to these important figures in their history, even those by whom the nation had begun, and understand that these blessings would be fulfilled as we consider the offspring of Boaz and Ruth. Remember the latter part of the chapter in the last few verses, it gave us the genealogy from Perez all the way down to David. Boaz and Ruth will have a great-grandson, and his name will be David, and he would be king of Israel. But they have the son, who is called Obed. We're told that Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom. The women who were around spoke of him and said, May he be a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. Your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons, because she has borne him. Naomi was indeed blessed in receiving this child. It was her husband's name who was to be cut off in Israel. And here is a child to perpetuate her husband's name. Boaz, in providing this child, has redeemed her husband's name has redeemed his place in the inheritance in Israel. And so such an important thing that has taken place. Obed would eventually have a son and call his name Jesse. And Jesse would have a son and call his name David. That would be King David of Israel. And so Boaz and Ruth were ancestors not only of David, but of the Christ. For the Christ came through David. Friends, may we be like Boaz and not this other relative. We shouldn't allow personal gain or loss to determine what we're going to do, if we're going to do the right thing or not. Go back with me to Deuteronomy 25, and I want you to see exactly how the law spoke about this duty, which Boaz was happy to perform, but this other man was not. In Deuteronomy 25, and at verse 5 beginning, it says, If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies, and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. 
Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders, and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer, and say, So shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal removed. Now there's a number of things in there that may seem odd to us, not being part of the culture of Israel. But it was a duty. This man was required to do this according to the law of Moses. And if he wasn't willing to do so, notice what we saw at verse 8 that the elders of the city are supposed to speak to him. This is your duty. This is what you're supposed to do. But if he still is firm in saying that he'll not do so, then notice the embarrassment that is to be brought upon him. He was unwilling to bear a child in order to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He was willing for his brother's name to be blotted out of Israel. And so, she was to come, the widow, before the elders and this man, remove his sandal from his foot. That was, in ancient times, something that was used as a sign of a covenant, sign of an agreement. He was to have his sandal removed, and then she would spit upon his face. So shall it be done, to the man who will not build up his brother's house. Friend, we need to be willing to do what is right, regardless of personal loss or gain. This other close relative we see in the text, he was willing so long as he thought that he was going to benefit. If it's going to be his property, he's happy to take it. But as soon as he found out that there was responsibility attached to it, that he was actually going to redeem it, not for himself, but for Naomi's offspring, then he wasn't willing. May we always be like Boaz and do the right thing for the simple reason that it is the right thing to do. Now, friend, we have said when we began this short study of the book of Ruth, that there is a picture of our own redemption in it. We are in the place of Ruth and Naomi, needing a Redeemer, not having an inheritance, our inheritance being wiped away. Sin is what caused it to be wiped away. When we transgress the law of God, we're told that the wages of sin is death. The Lord Jesus is in the place of Boaz. He is the close relative who seeks to redeem us. He is the one who provides the free gift of eternal life. He has done so through marriage. We read several times in the New Testament about the body of Christ, about it being his bride, In Ephesians chapter 5, we see the comparison of Christ and the church with a man and his wife. Jesus has provided salvation, has provided redemption for those who will become a part of his church. And so we need to be added to the body of Christ. 
if we're going to receive the redemption, if we're going to be bought back and thus have the hope of inheritance, the hope of eternal life, we must be added to the Lord's church. Well, what do we need to do in order to be added to the Lord's church? Friend, as we close out our program today, I want us to look in Acts chapter 2 because we find there the answer. In Acts chapter 2 and at verse 37, we find that in listening to the preaching of the Apostle Peter, the people who heard were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They had just heard that they had put to death the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer. And so what can we do? Of course, Peter said that he's been raised. It was not possible that death should hold him. In fact, he's been raised to the right hand of the throne of God. He's now reigning in heaven. But what shall we do? Take a look at verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. What shall we do? He doesn't say, as so many today will say, Oh, well, there's nothing you can do. You you need to just wait for the Lord to save you. That's not what Peter says. He doesn't say, as so many today will, well, just believe. All you have to do is believe. In fact, in verse 38, he didn't say anything about believing. They already did believe who Jesus was, but they weren't saved. What does he say? He says, repent. You need to turn away from sin. You need to have godly sorrow for sin. Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Be baptized, be immersed in water in order to have your sins forgiven. It's not that there's anything magical about the water. It is obedience to what the Lord has said for us to do. Peter refers to it in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 as the answer of a good conscience toward God. That is, we are willingly obeying the thing which God has commanded us to do. In Mark 16, at verse 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Friends, we need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. And then notice as we go on, verse 41 He says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Drop down to verse 47, and the latter part of that verse, it says that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. If we want to partake of the redemption, we need to be part of the marriage. If we want to be part of the marriage, we need to be added to to the Lord's church, His bride, will you do so even today, friend? We would love to sit down and study with you about what God would have us do so that we might be faithful servants of His. If we can help you in this regard, by all means, contact us. We encourage you to tune in again next week at this same time as once more we'll study from the Scriptures We also invite you to come and assemble with us this week. You would be an honored guest in our midst. We'd enjoy the opportunity to worship together. We wish you a great day and a good week.